track record of, uh, of work and skills in a particular area of focus in that sense. <coughs> you, you see that. So, I don't know if that helps. Mm -hmm. so. To follow up on that, could you uh, talk just a little bit more about right to work? Yeah. Um, so like if I, if my spouse got a job first, yeah. and we both moved to another country in Europe, yeah. um, what would right like to work mean for me in terms of finding an academic position or yeah. vice versa? In, in most cases, you, you, it depends on the country, um, but you, you, if you are married, you will get the right to work based on your spouse's work contract. Okay. So if your spouse's work contract is um, like a short term, like 15 months, and it's very narrowly tailored, you may not have the right to work. But if it's in like a you know a permanent position and you know it's, there's no close date on that, then you have the right to work. And does that so, so does that give me an advantage? Yes. Over, okay. I'm mean, assuming it did. It does. Yes. But yeah. It would. Yeah. Now, the challenging thing is with this is if you're talking about students. So students who go, their spouses in most cases do not have the right to work. So you are challenged that way. <coughs> um, so it's, uh, there was actually a talk by a graduate student from mm -hmm. the Hale program last year I saw at ASH and they called it the dead body visa. And it's probably the most accurate description I could describe it. Because as a spouse, particularly the spouses of students, you have no, no right to work. You basically have the right to exist in that country. You don't have rights to access a lot of cases medical care, health care, things like that. So it's, yeah. So would that be for like a postdoc yeah. scenario? No, the postdocs are a little bit different. So postdocs in most cases are considered employees of the university. Uh, in most cases, PhD, a lot of cases, PhD students are considered employees of the university, not students. Because um, you, so, so I, don't, I don't know if you guys also understand that the PhD structures are very different. Mm -hmm. So in most cases, you have no formalized curriculum. You have no courses you have to take. You, there's courses available and you take what you want and things like this, but you basically, you start off your program and you sit down with your advisor and you work out what you, your reading list and what you're going to develop and skills, and then as courses come along, you take those courses, but um, you're working on a research project, basically. And so you're considered, in a lot of cases, particularly in the sciences, uh, employee of the university. There are circumstances where that's not the case, but um, in most, in most cases, that's my understanding. So, with that, then your spouse would have the right. <coughs> but postdocs, um, in most cases, they would definitely have the right. Yeah. If if they are if they are a third country national. Are there a lot of postdoc opportunities for non-Europeans? Yes, and, and if I was if if I would say the best way to go is to go when you're young and not established in your career, or go when you are established. So the middle road, the middle murky thing, career, that's the challenging part. But if there are, there are most opportunities to go abroad, I would say for actually bachelor students in the US, for master's programs in, the, in, the, in the Europe. There's a lot of opportunities in funding. And then there's a little bit less for master's students and graduates to go on for PhDs. And those, and those are uh, opportunities. And then even less going up for PhD graduates for the postdoc positions. And there, it's, that is just simply because of supply and demand. There's just a lot of postdocs or PhDs that are being put out, and there's a very limited amount of postdocs available. However, the postdocs, when they come available, and they would be listed on the national country, on the national countries of websites. Um, those are, in general, uh, very skill specific. They're looking for very specific things. So if you match that, or you can show that you can do that, then you're given a you're given a good look. So. 
You had mentioned that when you first uh, got there and you were working with PhD students that you had to play catch up with the theory, like learning. Yeah. So can you speak a little bit more about what you meant by theory and... and um, right, okay, so I took a number of like sociological courses like introduction to sociological theory and with this. Um, so, you know, I read some of the classics, you know, the literature. But they are reading those, then they're reading other books talking about, like, Marxism in uh, the age of neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Foucault in the age of globalization, things like this. So it's, it is those theoretical frameworks in kind of the context, the context and beyond just the work itself. Mm -hmm. And the discussions and the depth of the discussions, I mean, I, I was out of my league. Mm -hmm. Just, <laughs> I was like, okay, I don't know this. And I mean, this was not my focus of my background to mm -hmm. begin with, but it was very clear that I was not even remotely close to that. And uh, in some ways, I was lucky that I, you know, I had I had sort of the imposter feel. If you will, like you know, like, oh, someone's going to find out that this. But it, it was okay because people. It was I was able to talk about it. We were able to talk and have discussions, and that's where actually I learned a lot and what books to read. And so I, I, this goes back to my point about ambiguity. You're going to find a lot of these things. Like, okay, now what do I do? And it's you know, like in that case, I took that opportunity and framed it as, hey, you know, tell me more about this, and what, what book did you read, and what did you read about this? And um, a lot of people are very happy to share what books and ideas and things like this, um, and particularly at the conferences. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can, you can get some, that's, that's where I had some of the best discussions on this. Do they cover that theory in their undergrad, or is that in their own research as they are doing their PhD work? It's if I in most cases it's their PhD work. So they their reading list, like I, uh, some of the PhD students in Finland, I look at their reading list, and like their first year they're reading you know, forty or fifty books, a couple hundred journal articles, things like this. But that's what they're doing. That's their job. Mm -hmm. If they're, they're not in a research methods course, they're not doing this. And this is why, like, particularly like the quantitative research skills are in demand there, are not necessarily in education, because this is not the focus. It's not something that it, it's grounded into the programs and the curriculum. And like that, the programs. So um, I think the American students, well, not necessarily American students, but students who come through the American system, probably a better way of saying it, are more well-rounded, have a better, broader experience, whereas the European PhD students who do a PhD in Europe are much more narrowly focused, but the depth that they can go, particularly from the theory, is much, much more greater. You know? So, so it, it's, it's, when you compete for those jobs, it's, it's, frame, it's framing how, what you can bring, mm -hmm. and then showing that you're willing to learn and being very humble, like, uh, I don't know that, and be, be frank about it, and be open about it, and that's okay, um, because they, they will work with you, they, they want to work with people who, who's willing to work and learn, and, but you have skills and things you can bring that they don't have, that is what they'll work for, and that's how, that's, that's your way in, that's, that's how to sell yourself, yeah. Yeah, uh, so, uh, the, the, the researchers that you're talking about have a lot of depth and theory, are they, uh, all, I, mean, I mean, are they qualitative researchers or uh, even the quantitative researchers have this strong theoretical depth? It's both. It's in both. Um, but it's, if I would have to characterize the work quantitative qual, it's much more qualitative okay. in, in Europe, in my opinion. In, in education. Okay. Again, this is for education. Okay. This, is, this is not um, in, in the other fields. So. And particularly, this is my experience within higher education. So, um, uh, you know, I've had a lot of conversations, like my background was in policy. So I had a lot of policy courses, I read a lot of policy stuff in my PhD program and afterwards. So I've had a lot of discussions in Finland about like policy diffusion and things like this. 
And these are concepts that are like, what is that? So I've had to sit there and explain what is policy of the future. So that's something that I was able to bring in as the value added that way. That, that's not necessarily you know, a quantitative research skill in that sense, but it's, um, I wouldn't have had that if it wasn't for the well-roundness of the curriculum of my program in that sense. So, um, but even with that said, the quantitative research there is very theoretical driven. So you go to, if you go to a conference and they will spend, you know, there's tw you know, 20 minutes to talk. They will spend 10 minutes of their talk about the theoretical framing of it, maybe five minutes about what the results are and what they mean. Whereas you go to that conference here in the U.S., it's, you know, like, oh, here's the theory, this is what we used, here's the results, and here's the methods, and, you know, that's the focus there. So it's a different take, if you will. Again, this is my opinion, but I, I feel very strongly in that, that that's kind of the general, general sense you'll get. And this, and this goes back to my earlier comment about getting out and going to um, uh, international conferences, whether here in the U.S. or uh, outside the U.S., you get these different perspectives of, um, you know, from different researchers of how they, how they go about their thing, there, about their work. Um, and it, it could appeal or not appeal to you. So, but it's... Um, but it's something that you can really think about how to frame your frame your work. Yeah. And yeah, with yeah. respect to this differences in presentation, I'm also curious how uh, the journal journal publications look like. Are they different from the way uh, uh, American papers are written, like with respect to sections and how methods is written? Uh, no, I mean, the f in general, they're roughly the same. Um, I mean, in terms of like content. Now, the focus, though. Like, again, I'll talk more about higher education because that's my area. Uh, like in the U.S., there's three big higher ed journals, um, review, research, and then journal of higher ed. Um, and you know, a couple of them are very quantitatively focused. I mean, you mean I think it's, uh, you know, for one of them, if you don't even have a quantitative model, they don't, you know, the editors don't want to go on and want to look at you. Whereas in, in in Europe, it's much more open in that sense. They want the quantitative work. There is some stuff that's there. There's, it, you see qualitative work. You see um, quantitative work that's much more descriptive. Um, so I, I may like some of the stuff that I'm doing, you know, quantitatively. It's I would characterize it as descriptive. That I would not be able to get away with that here. In, in the U.S. academia, but I am there because that is, um, it, it's not that it's a lesser standard, I would, I would argue that it's, it, it's not that, it's just a different perspective of what is important and what is, and what is valued, and what, what, is, and what, what the focus is on it. So. Yeah. yeah, just going back to the theory question, Yeah. yeah. This, is a, this is a quick question. Um, from a theoretical perspective, do you have you come into contact with interest in critical realism mm. at all? Um, does that even ring a bell? Yeah, yeah. Um, you see it in pockets, um, and you in, in it depends on the researcher. Mm -hmm. So you'll see some who are extremely critical, and you see some. They don't even come close to it. Mm -hmm. um, it. There is variance there, um, and I couldn't characterize it one way or the other. But it, it's there, and you can do it, and um, have a very strong voice. But then there's other people who who are considered sort of the you know, the elite European higher ed researchers who have never published a book. <coughs> in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, it's not to say their work is not good or whatever. It, 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 that's just not their focus. Sure. So, um, but there is space there for it. There is opportunities for that. And um, if there are, uh, and this might be something that we may want to talk individually about, mm -hmm. you know, who, who, who are some people that I would encourage you to look at 
and, and things like that, then yeah, that that's you know, those are some people. It's individualistic more than I would say to characterize the whole bigger picture of that. Again, that's my perspective. Sure. So, but yeah, Thank you. there's there's space. There. Yeah. I'll be in touch. All right. yeah. yeah, maybe another question or two, and we'll be about at our time. Oh, we are? Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, um, so I've seen that uh, the faculties and uh, faculty members in education here do a lot of quantitative work, which helps them do a lot of applied stuff, mm. like consultancy work and uh, taking yep. projects from the government and stuff. But since you said that uh, faculty members in education there in England don't do that much quant stuff, uh, do you think that restricts their if, uh, I mean, their uh, room to kind of uh, do some applied work or like yeah, state yeah. government projects and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, there's the, there is a lot of evaluation work. Um, but it's, uh, that is where you see a lot of these opportunities for um, academics to do um, this type of work. Um, that in the U.S. we would look at it as consulting or this or that, whereas in Europe, generally, it's more framed as um, it's grants or this and that. And um, so, like I, I mentioned earlier, my wife interviewed for today this grant for the Finnish, for the Finnish Ministry of Education. It's that in the U.S. context would be more of consulting work of what this is. Um, rather than in like the Finnish context, and, and I think it's fairly characterable to most of Europe, is that that is considered um, that would be like a short-term uh, funding grant by the government because they have a particular interest in finding out this answer to this specific question. And so the people that she competed with were consulting agencies. So you get this is where the consulting agencies will come in and things like that. And that uh, but it's where you don't see consulting agencies here in the U.S. compete for those type of funding opportunities that academics are doing. Like you see a lot more um, at the evalu um, with the evaluations. They're much more national um, perspective, and so they're they're much more nationally focused and driven. Um, and so those are things that a lot of the consulting companies, they don't want to necessarily touch those because A, the money is, is short, small, and B, it's, they're usually short-term contracts. So I don't know if that yeah. helped you. Or. Yeah, 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 yeah. So my question was slightly different in the sense that uh, here, uh, even people in education take up like very like causal kind of work. Yeah, I was just yeah, wondering, yeah. because there you say it's more descriptive, within education, it's more descriptive. So, so yeah. are they able to take, uh, I mean, so that's what I'm imagining, that yeah, people they, in education might not be able to do that kind of rigorous applied work. So they do they do evaluations, but mm -hmm. it's, um, so like, I, I was involved with um, one of the evaluations of all the international master's programs mm -hmm. in Finland. In the U.S., we would do a lot of you know quantitative analysis and outcomes and things like this. Whereas there, they interviewed a lot of people, and then took that and then looked at some of the descriptive data, and used that as the evaluation. And they used their professional opinion as the evaluative critique, not necessarily you know, like a quantitative output or things like that. So, so it, it, it was their professional opinion that these people are meeting the standards or these people are, are not and things like this. And here's why, based on what was said in these interviews, based on these are the goals, these are the, you know, the data that, you know, very descriptive data that we have. We have the X amount of students, we have Y amount of graduates, um, whereas in the U.S. it would be much more you know, applied, you know, creating, you know, your models and, you know, your outcomes and things like that and things like that. So, um, you see much more about the expert opinion. Uh, I think it, it's, it's, it, it carries the, the weight. Um, now this is, in, this is very much the Finnish context where research matters, particularly in education policy, um, which is rather refreshing. So, but it's, um, uh, I think that's much more characterized to Europe in general. 
Okay. Did that answer that better? Yeah. Okay. I think we're come up on our time here, right. but right. thank you, Dr. Matthews. We really appreciate your time. And oh, yeah. um, again, if people have further questions, and please take some he time. is actually uh, willing to sit down with people one on one and spend more time. So if you have specific questions about yep. options in Europe, funding, things like that, um, he's here till November 9th. Yep. Thank you. Yep.